talk is basically a, a kind of comparative uh, analysis of Huxley, a little bit like how Rianne was kind of positioning Huxley alongside D.H. Lawrence and kind of drawing out the contrast and the similarities there. Um, I, nah, mate, come on, there we go. <laughs> I am talking about um, uh, someone called J.B. Priestley. And oh, what's happened here? I've got my slides mixed up. That's the wrong J.B. Priestley. Uh, that's uh, Jason Bradford Priestley from Beverly Hills 90210. I'm not talking about him. That's uh, next week's conference. I'm talking about John Boynton Priestley, uh, who uh, some of you might remember from uh, plays like An Inspector Calls, uh, Dangerous Corner. Um, in his lifetime was a uh, quite prominent writer, broadcaster. Um, his uh, wartime radio broadcast, the postscripts, were uh, quite potent uh, at that time. So Graham Greene said he was a leader of his country, uh, second only to Churchill, uh, which is probably why the broadcasts were stopped eventually, because, um, you know, the, the, the Churchill cabinet didn't like uh, this bluff Yorkshireman kind of feeding socialist propaganda to the masses, so they put a stop to that. Um, but um, possibly work, stuff like the postscript and maybe works like English Journey as well may have contributed to at least helping build a, a, a national sentiment that um, led to the election of um, Clement, Clement Attlee's Labour government in 1945. Um, he remained politically engaged uh, in the, the post-war years, so he was a founding member of CND. Um, uh, among other things. Um, wasn't much of an institutional person. He kind of joined things, just get bored and walk away. Um, uh, and his in interest in psychology and mysticism uh, uh, comes to the fore. Uh, so he kind of helps introduce uh, some of the British public to Carl Jung uh, by doing a lecture on the BBC uh, about his theories. And then he brought Jung over uh, to do a, a, a lecture as well. Um, uh, and, and also he made um, uh, a couple of appeals for anecdotal reports of um, psi experiences and precognition, uh, things like that, dreams and stuff like that, um, out of which came a, a, a work called uh, Man and Time. Um, but the reason uh, uh, I'm talking about him is obviously, yes, he's my uh, great-grandfather. So the research I've been doing is kind of like a bit of family history you know, um, looking at his connections with people like, particularly like Huxley. Um, came about, I met um, this guy, Anthony Peake, who's spoken at Breaking Convention before, and um, uh, met him at a talk, and he introduced me to a lot of this side of Huxley. He wrote a book recently called Time in the Rose Garden, which uh, is out next year. Um, uh, he uh, also, his most recent work, Opening the Doors of Perception, builds on Huxley's ideas of uh, uh, mind at large as well. Uh, it's worth checking out. Um, and, um, yeah, so one line of connection, you know, I find particularly interesting is relationship with Huxley. Um, again, they cut quite distinct figures, you know. Uh, Huxley's there, sort of, you know, thin, aristocratic, gaunt, austere, and like Priestley's there, sort of big, gruff northerner with his pipe, sort of bon viveur type. Um, and they shared a lot of interests, uh, Eastern mysticism, Jungian psychology, uh, parapsychology, uh, political reform and radicalism. Um, and the deepest thing I think they shared was a, a powerful intuition that the, the manifest world of time and identity was concealing a, a much deeper reality um, and that this mystical leaning also underpins their socio-political ideas as well. So you can't really separate the, the two. Um, in case you're wondering uh, why this talk is called uh, Music and Night as well, it's because um, Priestley accidentally caught the title from uh, an essay that Huxley wrote uh, and used it for a play centered around a very similar theme, which is the capacity of music to reveal this uh, hidden reality. 
Uh, so it's set up this private violin concerto held at um, the, the house of a widow called Mrs. Amesbury. Uh, and as the play goes on and the, the music play, the music uh, carries on, each character is given uh, a kind of interior monologue of their own subjective experience through, um, through time and, and memory and thought and stuff like that. Um, and um, which expresses his fascination with music uh, as he believed that it was one of the, the most potent art forms uh, through which we can hear voices from beyond the veil, uh, the most uh, potent and magical of the arts. Um, and Huxley would agree, uh, I think, and in his own essay, Music at Night, uh, he writes on Beethoven that there, there is, or at least there sometimes seems to be a certain blessedness lying at the heart of things, of whose existence occasional accidents and providences make us obscurely, or it may be intensely, but always fleetingly aware. In the Benedictus, Beethoven gives expression to this awareness of blessedness. Uh, talking about the, the Benedictus by uh, Beethoven. Um, uh, which expresses his belief that, that art... Uh, could and should perhaps have some sort of transformative potential. Um, he wasn't a believer in art for art's sake, uh, and nor was Priestley, really, um, uh, whose Priestley has often been read as a, a kind of predominantly a social commentator who had a few weird theories of time on the side. Uh, but I would say that this is misplaced, and actually, yeah, they, they, those views on time and reality sort of underpin the, pol the political side and the social side as well. Um, so a good example would be his, um, his most famous work in Inspector Calls, uh, where a detective called Inspector Call turns up at the uh, house of a wealthy uh, industrialist family called the Burlings, uh, and says a, a young woman named Eva Smith has been taken to the infirmary uh, in a suicide. Uh, and and he proceeds to reveal to each member of the family their, uh, their actions which were complicit in leading this woman to take her life. Uh, and he finishes, he, as he's about to leave the house, he finishes with this warning. He says, we don't live alone. We are members of one body. We are responsible for each other. And I tell you that time will soon come when if men do not learn that lesson, then they will be taught it in fire and blood and anguish. And, uh, yeah. and uh, there's a supernatural twist at the end of uh, Inspector Calls when it's revealed that the inspector is not really an inspector and that there was no woman who turned up at the infirmary called Eva Smith. And it's all fine. It was all a big prank. And then they get a call saying... A young woman has been taken to the infirmary called Eva Smith. An inspector is on his way to talk to you guys about it. So, um, kind of implying that maybe uh, Inspector Gould was some sort of avenging spirit who, who had foreknowledge of what was going to happen uh, and prepared them to sort of reveal their, their, uh, their involvement in it. Um, it's still, you know, the play is often read, and not actually inaccurately necessarily, as being a, a, a piece of social commentary with a kind of ghostly twist. Um, but the way that Ghoul phrases this warning is peculiar. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't say that we're members of one society or we're members of one family. He says we're members of one body, um, which is a very, when you look at it, it's quite religious. You know, there, there's a, a passage from Corinthians uh, uh, where, I think it's St. Paul, um, who's, uh, uh, he says something to the effect of that, you know, we, the, the Christians, are, are, are members of one body, you know. Um, and, and also, uh, uh, Peake argued in his, in, in his uh, forthcoming book, and I'd, I'd also say that this is very compelling as well, that um, he could have been 
referring to the teachings of uh, Advaita Vedanta as well, the, uh, the, the non-dual tradition. Uh, uh, we can't be sure if that was a direct reference, but um, it's quite plausible that it may have been somewhere in the back of his mind because he'd been in quite uh, intensely interested in, Van in Vedanta from uh, the year 1912, which is actually where the, the play is, when the play is set. So it may have been uh, at least somewhere on the, the back of his mind. Um, so I think all of that suggests to me that, that, that you know, his metaphysical concerns were, were quite integrated with his political beliefs as well. They, they, they fed on, they nurtured each other. Um, and uh, I think also, I think Huxley as well, I, I think that definitely towards the later part of his career would, you know, his, his mysticism and his, you know, his politics were quite entwined. Um, they were a little different in the beginning. Uh, so, you know, he, he was a member of the Fabian Society. Um, uh, he was quite, uh, he was a, a bit elitist. He had a support for eugenics. Um, uh, 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 you know, his brother also, Julian Huxley, was, um, uh, I think, a, either a founding member or a very prominent figure in the British Eugenics Society. Um, uh, but he, but Hux, uh, Aldous, that is, um, he, he softened his attitudes as he got older and has, as he got uh, more into mysticism, uh, partly through befriending Gerald Hurd, who was also an associate of Priestley's, um, who convinced him of the value of mysticism uh, and introduced him to the, the, the Vedanta Society, um, um, which led, you know, to his experiments with psychedelics, you know, his meeting of, with uh, Krishnamurti um, as well. Uh, and um, uh, he made... He, remained quite an engaged social commentator, as the sadly late David Bradshaw has shown, uh, uh, after his mystical experiences, and uh, indeed grew to be a, perhaps a more open and compassionate commentator than he was before. Uh, the most comprehensive statement of the period uh, is his final novel, Island, uh, which, you know, um, uh, shows this um, sort of integrated society where, which is socially and ecologically harmonious uh, because the benefits of spiritual insight have been integrated into every aspect of its functioning, you know. Um, and, you know, uh, as Rianne has pointed out, the, the, it's very much like the, the antithesis of Brave New World, you know. It's, uh, uh, you have the, the moksha medicine, uh, is used as a sort of tool for higher understanding where you know the, the soma is used to kind of deaden and suppress and reduce the sensitivity you know so um yeah uh and kind of facilitate their acceptance of an irredeemably corrupt and technocratic society i'm sure none of us could ever imagine living in that kind of society you know uh but if you are and it's worrying you then you can just microdose with acid and uh, maximize your productivity. So uh, there you go. Uh, which brings me to the subject of time, uh, because time was of uh, paramount importance to these two writers, um, who were both, uh, of course, uh, influenced by the theories of Henri Bergson, uh, uh, of J.W. Dunn, who argued that we have um, uh, a four-dimensional self through which we can view the three-dimensional stretch of our lives as a kind of, um, you know, uh, from India they have a, a, an image of the, ah, the, the long body, I forget the, um, uh, hmm? Linga Sharia. Linga Sharia, that's it, that's it. Um, uh, where you can see the, the whole stretch of your life uh, as a three-dimensional entity from your four-dimensional perspective. Um, and, and also the, uh, the, the, the theories of P.D. Uspensky as well, uh, who said that we, we get chances to re-experience our lives 
over and over again until we sort of um, uh, get certain things right. Um, it's not to say that they were necessarily adopting these ideas wholesale, um, but they, 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 were, they were interested in them because they found that there was a way out of the, uh, of the linear constraining nature of time as it's generally presented to us, you know. Um, so modern society is to use Priestley's term time haunted. You know, anxiety is the, is the modern disease, you know. Uh, uh, and those who have the chemical means to subjugate that anxiety would have a, a huge amount of power over society. So uh, in Brave New World, uh, Dr. Shaw says to John Savage that, um, that think of Soma, he's talking about Soma, and he's trying to extol its benefits to this kind of bewildered John Savage from the, the, the reservation in New Mexico. Uh, he says, think of the enormous immeasurable durations it can give you out of time. Every Soma holiday is a bit of what our ancestors used to call eternity. Um, and uh, Priestley deals with a similar uh, substance to, to, to Soma in a novel called The Magicians, which kind of reads like a prelude to, uh, to Brave New World, because a, a sinister cabal is plotting to uh, take control of, of society through the means of this uh, experimental axiolytic called Setman 18, but uh, temporarily they're thwarted by a kind of trio of psychic debt psychologists who sort of manipulate time and memory uh, in this almost kind of therapeutic way so that the bad guys are reduced to these blubbering infantile wrecks. Uh, again, showing the influence of Jung psychology uh, on Priestley. Um, and there's an awful lot more that I'd like to go into. Um, you know, their shared interest in parapsychology, in Tibetan Buddhism, and in all this kind of stuff. But I haven't got that much time. So I'm going to finish uh, with uh, my favorite piece of my, of my great grandfather's writing, um, which is a description of a vision taken from Rain Upon God's Hill. And he describes it as a dream. Um, it, it's a very potent and profound dream. I don't know, uh, I've not heard or seen or found any evidence that he ever experimented with profoundly mind-altering substance, substances other than whiskey and cigars, maybe, every now and then. Um, but, um, you know, if he did, then perhaps he was reticent about it, but we don't know. Um, anyway, he describes it as a dream, where he says... I was standing at the top of a very high tower, alone, looking down upon the myriads of birds flying in one direction. Every kind of bird was there, all the birds in the world. It was a noble sight, this vast aerial river of birds. But now, in some mysterious fashion, the gear was changed, and time speeded up. So I saw... Generations of birds watch them break their shells, flutter into life, mate, weaken, falter, and die. Wings grew only to crumble, bodies were sleek, and then in a flash bled and shriveled, and death struck everywhere at every second. What was the use of all this blind struggle for life? This eager trying of wings, this hurried mating, this flight and surge, all this gigantic, meaningless, biological effort. As I stared down, seeming to see every creature's ignoble little history, almost at a glance, I felt sick at heart. It would be better if not one of them, if not one of us at all, had been born if the struggle ceased forever. I stood on my tower, still alone, desperately unhappy. But now, the gear was changed again, and time went faster still, and it was rushing by at such a rate that the birds 
could not show any movement, but were like an enormous plane sewn with feathers. But along this plane, flickering through the bodies themselves, they have now passed a sort of white flame, trembling, dancing, then hurrying on. As soon as I saw it, I knew that this white flame was life itself, the very quintessence of being. And then it came to me in a rocket burst of ecstasy that nothing mattered, nothing could ever matter, because nothing else was real but this quivering and hurrying lambency of being. Birds, people, or creatures not yet shaped and coloured, all were of no account except so much as this flame of life travelled through them. It left nothing to mourn over behind it. What I had thought of as tragedy was mere emptiness or a shadow show. For now all real feeling was caught and purified and danced on ecstatically with the white flame of life. I had never before felt such happiness as I knew at the end of my dream of the tower and the birds. And here, I think we can relate to this bit. Uh, if I have not kept that happiness with me as an inner atmosphere and sanctuary for the heart, that is because I am a weak and foolish man who allows the mad world to come trampling in, destroying every green shoot of wisdom. Never, nevertheless, I have not been quite the same man since. A dream had come through the multitude of business. Um, so I don't have a lot to add to that. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.